LinkedIn presents. I'm Rufus Griscom, and this is The Next Big Idea. Today, how generosity goes viral. In February 1984, Richard Saul Werman, an architect and graphic designer, invited 300 of his friends and colleagues to Monterey, California for a first-of-its-kind conference. Together, they got to see Apple's brand-new Macintosh and play with a shiny gadget called the CD-ROM. They heard mathematician Benoit Mandelbrot deliver an 18-minute lecture on fractals. Technologist Nicholas Negroponte spoke about the exciting future of touchscreen displays. The event was called TED, an acronym for Technology, Entertainment, and Design. And it was a flop. So much so that the annual conference didn't happen again for six years. Eventually, TED gathered steam. By charging thousands of dollars for a ticket, it managed to turn a profit. But the high price tag drew criticism. Wired Magazine referred to it as, quote, an annual conference for wealthy eggheads. That changed, however, in 2006. By then, a former magazine publisher named Chris Anderson had taken over. And that year, Chris and his colleagues decided to do something bold. They decided to post videos from the conference online for free. This was a counterintuitive move. At a time when websites were struggling to pay the bills, video was expensive, and paywalls were common. The results succeeded their wildest dreams. They hoped the videos would slowly garner maybe 10,000 views. They hit that number on day one. Today, TED Talks are seen or heard more than 3 billion times per year. In fact, they regularly appear on this show. In March 2021, we sampled this. I grew up in the hood in Miami, in a poor neighborhood. I came from a community in which drug use was prevalent. I kept a gun in my car. I engaged in petty crime. I used and sold drugs. That's Dr. Carl Hart, a professor of psychology at Columbia, whose book, Drug Use for Grownups, makes the daring and, I think, brave argument that drug use by responsible adults can be a good thing. If you're a longtime listener, you've heard our curator Adam Grant, a four-time TED Talker, describe his experiences at the conference. Adam is such a regular on the TED stage that his daughter makes fun of him for it. I'm Adam Grant, and this is my TED Talk. You know how when you put a frog in cold or warm water, it jumps right out? But when you put it in lukewarm water, it stays in and hangs out there for a while. This is an example of thinking again. P.S. I'm bald. We've even shared with you clips from the talk that I delivered with my wife, Alisa, at a TED event in 2010. And I often joke with Rufus when he comes home that I'm not sure he would actually be able to find our child in a lineup uh, amongst other babies. So I actually threw a pop quiz here onto Rufus. Oh. Um, I don't want to embarrass him too much. That is not fair. But I am going to give him three seconds. This is a trick question. He's not up there, is he? No, okay. Our our eight-week-old son is somewhere in here. And I I want to see if Rufus can actually quickly identify. Far left. Far left. No. Recently, though, I've begun to see all these TED Talks in a different light. I used to think of them as elegantly wrapped little nuggets of wisdom. Now I realize that they're more than that. They're acts of infectious generosity. In an era when the news has a negativity bias and algorithms amplify our worst instincts, TED Talks look like beacons of intelligence and optimism, viral units of hope. I know they're easy to mock. They promote a faux folksy style and they've become passport stamps for academics who want to secure high dollar book deals. They sometimes smack of tech utopianism. But when so much of the content we consume is frankly vacuous drivel, the TED Talk, despite its flaws, stands as a shining example of creativity and big thinking gone mainstream. You may have noted the phrase I used a moment ago, infectious generosity. 
That happens to be the name of a new book by head of TED, Chris Anderson. It's all about this idea that through the power of the internet, small acts of thoughtfulness can spread with unprecedented speed. Kirkus Reviews called it, quote, a joyful roadmap away from a polarized self or society to the hopeful, humane place where we should be. Let's go there. The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by Medtronic. Medtronic is dedicated to the pursuit of life-transforming health tech. From AI to robotics and beyond, we're reinventing what's possible, and we're just getting started. Visit Medtronic.com to learn more. Chris Anderson, welcome to The Next Big Idea. It's great to be here, Rufus. Chris, you are the head of TED. You've been running the TED conference for more than 20 years. And I think almost everyone listening has heard of TED Talks. They're viewed and listened to more than 3 billion times annually, I just read, which is just astonishing. But that was not the case in 2002 when you took over the TED conference. What was the TED conference like back then and what caused it to blow up? When I first went to TED in 1998, there was a, you know, this beautiful, excited community there of people dreaming hopefully about the future. The internet growth was in full spurt mode. And um it was it was exciting. It was really, really exciting. I, I felt in some ways I'd come home. You know, I'm an mm, awkward person. I'm a I'm a bit of an <laughs> introvert. I'm a Brit. I don't like small talk. I'm terrible at it. At TED, you could have dreamy conversations about what if, what if we built this, or could the internet one day do that? And it was it was very very exciting. Soon after acquiring TED through through a nonprofit, I think that you correct that you had, you and your team, I think, made an unlikely decision that I think you see as critical to the expansion of the TED phenomenon. Can you tell us about that? Right. So we had felt, because we were a nonprofit and TED was inspiring, that we had some sort of obligation to let that out into the world somehow. Uh, but it, it wasn't clear how to do that. We tried to persuade television companies to do a program of TED Talks, and they thought, don't be silly. These are really boring. Talking heads, <laughs> right. what, what are you thinking of? So we failed on that. But then online video showed up, this unlikely little technology that didn't really have a very grand start. I mean, early internet online video, if you remember, was deeply sure. unimpressive. And yet, I've come to believe it's a, it's a really profound invention because it has allowed humans to scale basically anything that you can show or do you know, with another human. So, so something yeah, as primal yeah. as talking to another human being. That has never really been scalable before, at least not for everyone on radio and TV could kind of scale it. But for ordinary people, you could not scale those things, which is why writing is the technology that changed the world. Writing you could print and send out to millions of people. Now, suddenly, voices and people talking on a stage, as well as many other things, could scale to millions. And we we thought we had a duty to try this, even though we were very skeptical whether the inspiration people felt in the room would be felt when you watched a video. We tried an experiment, and to our shock and delight, uh, but also slightly to our dismay, <laughs> these things went viral and um, gave us this this dilemma. We should put all of our stuff online for free, because that is kind of what the internet wants. And um, we worried that that would kill the conference, but because we're a nonprofit and because you know, we'd listen to all these TED Talks saying, actually, in the internet age, the rules are different. So we went with it. And we were we discovered, yes, the rules are different in the internet age. You give stuff away and amazing things happen as a result. In our case, these talks spread across the internet. We had thousands of people reaching out to us to say, could we translate these into our language? And it enhanced, I mean, it basically gave TED a, a, a global reputation, which meant that demand for the conference actually went up, not down. And it completely changed my mind about how to think about 
business strategy, for want of a better word, in the internet age. It felt like radical generosity should be at the heart of any business strategy in this connected era. Now, do I remember correctly that I, I, I think I read an article that you wrote in Wired magazine more than 15 years ago after this, you made this decision to make the videos free, describing kind of the, you know, w- what a kind of turning point it was. And I think I remember you saying that the quality of the talks themselves got better because people would would pull up, you know, examples of TED Talks and say, wow, I've got to raise my game. I can't just, I can't just do my standard shtick. This is, people are sharing in a powerful new way here, and I have to take it up a notch. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, I actually learned that idea from uh, a, a talk at TED, but by a group of dancers, the LXD, the Legion of Extraordinary Dancers, yeah. who had basically been recruited off of YouTube, where you'd had this phenomenon where kids around the world were inspiring each other to ever greater dance feats, and they had become amazing. And what I learned was that when you poked under the surface, there were all of these niche communities forming on YouTube, whether it was cake decoration or makeup or monocyclists. People were teaching each other to get better. Mm. And wow. it's a phenomenon yeah. that I started to call crowd-accelerated learning. And it, it definitely applied to TED speakers as well. You, They would see some right, artists right. talk and go, way, I can raise my game. And and so that that's a probably an underreported thrilling factor of the modern era is that we are teaching ourselves to be better at almost anything. And, and it's, 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 it's almost taken so for granted now that, that we hardly remark on it. But it is amazing that we're in a moment where you can learn anything you choose to from, from the internet, from other people's, I'm going to say generosity. It's not yeah, yeah. just simple generosity. There's usually, a, you know, they're hoping to get something back from it, but, but it's, it's basically unique. It's never happened before, and it's really powerful. And then the decision to launch TEDx was another exercise in generosity that was also a real brand risk, wasn't it? Right. So this one felt riskier still. We'd become obsessed with this idea of radical generosity and how could we, you know, what else could we give away? And the biggest thing we could think of was our brand. And, and we had people wanting to do TED events. They wanted us to come and do them and we couldn't. You know, we couldn't travel the world doing lots of different TED events. So we said, okay, well, why don't you do them? And uh, we created this brand TEDx, where the X was supposed to be an asterisk standing for self-organized. So, you know, TEDx Lagos, you could do a TED event in Lagos that was self-organized there. These things took off like crazy. We've ended up now with about 3,000 curatorial teams around the world. They're probably... 60 or 70,000 volunteers at any one time working wow. on TEDx events. So we don't pay them. They're doing yeah. it at their own financial risk. We get 25,000 videos a year from this. So, so from a business point of view, it's actually the most brilliant thing we could have done. It was partly motivated by the fact that we should do it. Um, and um, but but the but the business results like the there were definitely some risks and downsides and we had some embarrassing moments but the upsides vastly 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 greater it massively expanded TED's reach across the world it actually brought to us many of the best TED speakers came up through TEDx not anyone we found came up through TEDx that's right that yeah, that's extraordinary and so this this spirit of generosity was present in. Making the videos free it was you know radical decision at the time. Lending the brand out in the form of these TEDx events, and also I think the instructions to speakers. Right? Uh, I mean, you, you'd often say, "Hey, th- you know, think think of your speech as a as a gift." And, and of course, I remember this, Chris, because as you may remember, my wife and I gave a talk at TED Women some twelve years ago, and I remember receiving in the mail. A, a piece of stone on which was printed the Ted Commandments. I don't know if you still do that, <laughs> right? It included like, thou shalt not sell, thou shalt tell a story, thou shalt not read thy speech, right? <laughs> and uh, and I'll never forget driving down to Ted Women in Washington, D.C. In, in a minivan with children vomiting on me, rewriting our... <laughs> Our TED talk, and try, and really inspired by this notion of think of it as a, as a gift, and what is the, mm. 
what's the gift? And the gift for us was sending this message of, it was about parenting taboos, you may remember, and the gift was, oh, what, I was, it, it. <laughs> was to talk about, uh, you know, it's hard to be a parent, it's humbling, and that's what's great about it. And, and we've received hundreds and hundreds of, of, of thank you notes and still do occasionally from people saying, thank you for that message, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and uh, the, it, I, I, cer I certainly, in my own small and humble way, experience some of that kind of contagious generosity, frankly, of the of the TED exercise. Well, I think it's exactly the right way to to think about it. It is the number one thing we say to speakers now. We at last don't have those stone tablets now, although there's a case to bring them back because they were hellish fun. Um, <laughs> but the, num the number one commandment, if there was one, would be thou shalt give a gift. And it's flipping how we normally think of an opportunity, you know, a talk, which is to promote my cause or my company or myself. Yes. And instead yeah. say, no, 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 no. It's a gift. You have something in your mind that is really precious that you have learned and that many people out there would actually benefit from knowing. And the fact that you can open your mouth and go blah, 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 and, and the sound waves go into their ears and they their brains get slightly rewired. And then they have this thing in their heads that gives them extra value in some way for potentially years to come. That is that is a remarkable thing and it's and it's a beautiful way to think about it and the thing is you can tell the difference between speakers who are trying to share something they're trying to offer something as a gift versus those that are are kind of self-aggrandized in some way audiences see through it and they open up mm, to the givers yeah. <laughs> and so paradoxically those, those those talks also do a lot better that way your talk by the way it was hilarious and and unexpected <laughs> yeah. in so many ways. We, you know, you expect a talk on from parents on kids. It's like, oh, the little darlings, how lovely it is! Come on, <laughs> yeah. let's love our kids better. And yeah. you, you were so funny and honest, and and you know about just how how hard a thing it is, and no wonder that resonated with with so many people. You describe in your book, Chris, the ways in which generosity has kind of always been contagious, right? It's inherently contagious, but there's kind of a new physics of the contagion of generosity that's happening online, resulting in what you call unprecedented torrents of amazingness, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, how should we think about how the online medium has, has changed what was already a kind of contagious nature of generosity? So, so yes, yeah, so in our biology, there are instincts to be generous, there are instincts to respond to generosity, and to that extent, generosity in every culture has had a contagious element to it. Someone's kind and others respond. That's always been true. But there are, I think, three elements of the connected world that when you put them together, really create a dazzlingly powerful logic for thinking differently about generosity. To me, the three things are just one that we increasingly value non-material things, you know, basically mm -hmm. the products yeah. of human minds, creativity, knowledge, co software, apps, video, all, all this kind of stuff. This is where we spend our time and where we learn so much and it holds our attention. And increasingly in companies, this is where value is created. It's in, it's in these non-material things, if you like. Bits have become more powerful than atoms. So that's one thing. The second thing is that those non-material things can be shared online. They can be given away online. And they can be given away at inf infinite scale and for a total cost of zero. One thing, one object can be placed online on the internet mm. and can can spawn yeah. to millions of computers potentially and, and without cost. So, so I think that's remarkable. And then the third piece is that gifts carry with them reputation. Mm. And reputation yeah. is the most important currency of the age yes. that we're in. So th you put those three things together and you see, of why on earth aren't we all spending all of our time sharing amazing things with each other and collectively raising you know the the wonders of humanity and to an extent we are i mean there has been an absolute explosion and torrent of free content because we're yes. humans and we adjust to amazingness annoyingly quickly we, yeah, we take it yeah. all for granted you know yeah, you, you yeah. the fact that you can go go onto the computer and have yeah. infinite scroll of beautiful video or images or inspiring stories or knowledge or learn whatever you want to. It is, it is historically without precedent and it is, it is amazing. Yeah. 
Um, but it um, is, it, and, and, yeah. and this is why I think the rules have changed. It's those it's those three things together make it irresistible to figure out your own generosity strategy because it can carry your reputation to the far corners of the of the planet if you get it right. Thinking of examples of of what you call unprecedented torrents of amazingness, um, I, I love the example of the of the barber who offered haircuts to people without homes uh, and asked them to tell their stories. Now, now that was an act of generosity in, in you know uh, obviously in person in physical space, but the ability to share that act of generosity made it much more powerful, didn't it? That's right. This is the thing when. Um, the, the individual acts that people can do, if they are done with imagination and love and creativity and boldness sometimes, they will break through the noise and and go viral in a beautiful way. So so this hairdresser, Joshua Coombs, um, was on the streets and noticed someone, uh, made that awkward step. It's the initial gift that actually is the sort of founding act of generosity of so many things. He gave this man his attention, looked at him, had a conversation with him, and then offered to cut his hair. He had his kit with him and he offered to cut his hair. And this this turned out to be the most moving experience. The man felt transformed. Joshua Coombs felt transformed by it because mm. it had been so easy to do, to make a huge difference to someone's life. And so he started doing this again and in different cities and he started posting about it. And the images and the stories were just widely shared on Instagram. For me, like one of the most amazing moments is giving someone the mirror at the end of the haircut because it's great to see someone's reaction because they might recognize someone they haven't seen for a few years. <laughs> oh, 20 years younger. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's true. What we said. Nobody's going to recognize me. Mate, you're a, oh. you're a new man right yeah, now. Thank you. How do you feel? Um, like a new man? It's just a beautiful example of how, in, in this age, one, one person's imagination and kindness can inspire so, so many others. Yeah, absolutely. No, there, well, there's, there are so many wonderful examples of this in your book, which are, which are inspiring. And you make this great observation that there's a negativity bias in media, as you point out, you know, mm. negative headlines are good business. And so in order for acts of kindness and generosity to compete with this sort of, you know, attraction to dramatically negative headlines, we have to be creative. And we also have to choose to, sh to share these acts, right? And uh, I think that's a very interesting observation. That it's not just it's not just sort of random acts of kindness. There's a lot of thought by a lot of people put into creative and intentional acts of contagious generosity. Mm. That's part of the story, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, look, the first observation is just how powerful the notion of infectiousness is. We normally think in incremental terms. We think that if we work 10% harder, we may get 10% greater benefit. In the world of online connection, this is not the way to think of it. The way to think of it is that if you can hit ignition, if you can get something to go viral, it is transformative. So if 10 people hear your story and pass it on to nine others, at most 100 people will hear that story. If 10 people pass it on to 11 people, then millions of people may hear that story. But the difference between nine and 11 isn't that much. It's about, it's about making that extra effort. It's the difference between in the, you know, in the pandemic of a virus having an R naught number that's mm, less than yes. one or more than one. It, it, yeah. Everything depends on this. And so, yes. so we, it's, it's hugely in our interest to figure out how to cross that chasm, that, that extra, 20% let's let's say and i think part, part of what the joy of this was going was looking at people who've actually got this to work and trying to decode their playbook and it's a decodable playbook i mean things like creativity and courage and human emotion if you package them the right way suddenly wow these things can go viral and i guess you know the poster child of this or someone who's cracked the code better than yeah anyone is Jimmy Donaldson, AKA Mr. Beast. Um, oh, yes, it is, yes. <laughs> yeah. it is notable that 
you know, whereas on on um, social media platforms, often the biggest voices are the ones, you know, sparking political drama. Um, also, often political hatred and and distrust and all the rest of it. On YouTube, the the big I think is the biggest influencer now on yeah. on YouTube with like more than two hundred forty million subscribers. He's he's done it by going for the big emotions, the positive emotions, the laughter and the excitement and the wow and the yeah. delight and the craziness, and um, uh, and a lot of his videos are stories of kindness told in the most spectacular yeah. way. Um, and it's everything from, you know, set up a car dealership and people coming to buy a car and how much is the car? Oh, 50 bucks. What? <laughs> okay, yeah. 25 then. Yeah. You know, and, and right. so, so that sort of delight of giving away, basically giving away yeah. cars. But through to, yeah. you know, here's a, hun here's a thousand people who were given their eyesight through cataract surgery. In this video, we're hearing a thousand people's blindness. It's gonna be crazy. Oh. Wow. She's just one of a thousand blind people we help from around the world. You know, he sparked debate because he's so successful yes. now. Like, literally, he has more success than any multi-billion dollar corporation in terms of, like, if you wanted to put a video out onto YouTube and, and have... 50 million views in a week. Do you back the billion dollar corporation or do you back Mr. Beast? Well, you back Mr. Beast because he does it pretty much every time. So, so the fact that he is inspiring so many in the next generation to think of kindness as cool, I think is a huge, huge, huge gift to us all. Some people don't, you know, like his style. They're jealous of it, or they, they. Yeah. There's lots of ways that you can critique it at some level. Oh, he's not bringing about massive system change, or yeah. oh, he's yeah. doing it to build views. Well, did you talk to the people who got their eyesight restored? Yeah. You know, do, do, yeah. do they regret being filmed by him? I don't think they do, and yeah. uh, I, I, I just think. It's incredibly hopeful that someone like him is the person who's really being so effective on on YouTube. It's it's he who's cracked yeah. the code more than the bad guys, right? And he's uh, among my children and their friends. He's very popular. I think a lot of uh, a lot of parents think of him as being this sort of extravagant, materialistic fellow who does these grand acts. But as you say, I. I I guess in that in that one video, he he funded cataract surgery for something like a thousand people, yeah. and filmed them seeing their families for the first time. And he did receive a good amount of criticism, right? That this is exploitative. But you really take that on point by point the the criticism that he's received. It's definitely possible to do exploitative kindness videos. I think the key test is is I think two things. One is just n knowing the person behind them and their true motivation. And I've I've spoken with people close to Jimmy, including the, the man running his philanthropy. They've persuaded me he's he's the real deal. He's in this for the long term. He he wants to use his incredible platform for good. And secondly, the people who participate in the video, I think they do take strong efforts to ensure that this is done with with respect. Well, I, I, I am certainly, Chris, imperfect in my journey towards greater generosity. Um, at, but what, what, one of the things that when I walk home from school with my son, we try to, in New York City, one of the things we try to do is pick up trash as we go, you know, mm. um, and, uh, you know, put it in the trash bins. And, uh, but I, I was kind of inspired by the story of the, I guess, it, was it in Japan, the, the samurai trash collectors who, who clearly figured out how to do this in a way that was contagious. We our, our our trash pickup efforts have not generated contagion, but but I think these these folks in Japan did. So this is a, this is so delightful. This is an example of just the power of creativity and yeah, how if yeah. you combine good intent with a bit of creativity, you can massively amplify it. Um this group went out as a group to pick up litter, but they dressed up and they did it the samurai way, that stab a piece of litter and flick it up in the air and catch it in a basket. And it was it was just very ceremonial and grand and and funny and exciting and cool to watch. And the videos went viral and 
it inspired many other people to go out and pick up litter, pick up trash. Yeah. So this is possible with a bit of with a bit of imagination. The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. In the last 100 years, we've seen financial markets swing, new currencies come and go, decades of savings lost in days, all showing that a retirement plan without a guarantee, quite simply, isn't enough. So more than a retirement plan, TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life, a promise that pays off. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. Let's dig into the science of generosity. Do we have an instinct for generosity? And if we do, where does it come from? Hmm. Um, we do. It's a little crude, but it's very, very powerful. Scientists disagree on where it came from, but I think it fundamentally comes from the fact that generosity is is asymmetric. It, there are many, yeah, many circumstances right. where it is relatively easy to give something away, and it means a huge amount to the recipient. So in, a, in, a, in the small communities in which we evolved, it's very easy to imagine someone with meat from a fresh kill yes. um, and no refrigerator. W w your families had their fill it's actually really quite easy to share the rest of the meat with your community. And um, and so long as they have a memory, and so long as there are repeated interactions between you, this is going to be in your interest as well. People will remember. And so the, 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 the belief is that over time, humans evolved this suite of emotions that include this, this just this desire to help others in your community, but also a sense of fairness. And, you know, we, we do track whether others play their part. No culture likes freeloaders or cheaters. Yes, um, yes. And, and um, so, so there's something very, very powerful in us. And you can, you can tell that by what, you know, anytime you see someone in great pain, you will feel agitated. You will feel that pain. You will feel like you should do something. Whether you do or not, there's other things in play, yes. but you will feel it. And, yeah. and that is a biological thing. Now then, it's not perfect. It mostly operates toward our in-group. And yes. you know, people who we don't perceive as our in-group, we may not react the same way to them. So it's, it's an instinct, like many of our other instincts, that needs nurturing with our reflective selves. You know, our, our yeah. hunger is an instinct and it's a very natural instinct, but it also needs, in the modern age, a little editing. <laughs> you can yes. have too much of a yes. good thing. Right, and, right, um, right. <laughs> so generosity is there and so also is the desire to respond to generosity. So as you say, the bad news is this, this human instinct for generosity tends to be in-group specific. And so that's sort of unfortunate, right? <laughs> right? We can we can exclude others from this this generous instinct, but the good news is there's this evidence that we can we can expand our perception of uh, of who our in group is mm. with relatively small changes. Yeah, this is this is hugely hugely good news that who we who we think of as we shifts over time and it. It comes through many things. It can be as simple as just being part of a team or with the same sport shirt or or what whatever. That can that can build a sort of sense of community. I think probably one of the most powerful ways of doing it is it's just storytelling. When you hear a story told through someone else's voice, you you understand them, you feel their humanity. And I think the spread of novels over centuries, I think, I think television you know that like the the issues in northern ireland i've heard it argued yeah, very compellingly yeah. that a big reason why peace was possible in northern ireland was because you had a generation growing up watching the bbc and you hear stories of people from both sides and wait a sec that's a kid who's kind of like me they're into football and they're into dating and and yeah. you know are we really that different and um uh, and so this is by the way is why 
I, I found the internet so hopeful that you had a technology where suddenly it was possible to see anyone in the world and you could hear their stories and and maybe there was a pathway here where we all finally realized that we're one human race and we might as well look after each other's interests. Um, because in principle, there's no reason, in terms of our biological wiring, there is absolutely yeah. no reason why people can't expand their yes. sense of in-group to encompass the whole human race. And these moments when we expand our our, our in-group are sometimes palpable. And to me, this is so exciting. Like, you know, living in New York City, as you and I do, you know, people are often have this constrained sense of, of like protecting their nuclear family or their tribe of friends or whatever it is. But I think of like 9-11 in New York, mm. when all of a sudden there were lines around the block to donate blood. And no one, as I remember it, no one fought over a taxi for a couple of weeks. I mean, there was just this outpouring of connection, right? And, you know, this is something that, you know, Rutger Bregman in his book, Humankind, talks a bit about acts of kindness in moments of crisis, right? That we have this ability to really kind of suddenly, you know, dramatically expand our conception of who, of who our in-group is with whom we're generous. Mm -hmm. uh, and though there are plenty of things I fear about the future, I think I'm most hopeful about the idea that as we approach an age of abundance, hopefully knock on wood, that that we could with a few small changes really kind of radically expand our our, our generous behavior. I, I don't think it's inevitable, but it feels like it's, it's possible. Well, that's definitely my hope too, my deep hope. And it won't be easy. I think it starts with just us admitting to ourselves that we are fragile, that we're full of these contradictions, yeah. that we have these instincts to the dark side often, you know, that we're vulnerable to threats and to anger at others and so forth. And 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 just getting smarter about how we nurture our reflective selves and how we mm. negotiate around our lizard brain instincts to do crazy stuff. This to me is the single biggest journey of wisdom in, in our lives, is, is learning how to outwit the parts of ourselves that, that we don't love, but which often drive our behavior. Everything hangs on that, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, expanding on the, uh, on the science of generosity, um, we hear a lot that generous people are happier you describe it in the book as a clear-cut finding in social science. What evidence is there that, that generous people are happier? Apart from the collected sayings of pretty much every wise person who ever walked the yeah. planet. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, no, there was, there was um, a Gallup survey done a few years ago of, I think, 230,000 people across more than 100 countries, mm -hmm. where every type of question was asked, but including the question of, you know, did you recently donate money to a cause? And astonishingly, this survey found that those who had donated were significantly happier than those who had not, yeah. basically equivalent to a doubling of their income. That's, that's what the numbers wow. suggested. Now, there's causation and then there's correlation. It's possible that it's happy people who choose to donate, but there's other science yeah, that yeah. indicates there's real causality here as well, that the act mm -hmm. of being generous carries with it happiness. You participated in a pretty extraordinary experiment that provides kind of more support for this idea. I, I think you called it the mystery experiment. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So this was a hoot. So. There was a couple in the TED community who m made some money and wanted to give most of it away. So they they worked with us. To, they wanted to learn something from it, like do it in an imaginative way. And so with the help of the University of British Columbia, we helped create this thing called the Mystery Experiment, where people were invited to take part in an unspecified social experiment, no mention of cash. 200 people were selected out of the couple thousand who 
who applied uh, across seven countries, different income levels. And they were given $10,000 each, no strings attached. <laughs> and um, I don't know what people would predict would happen if you were given $10,000, no strings attached. On average, these 200 people basically spent two thirds of that money generously. Um, some of that was to family members, but to strangers, to friends, to causes. A lot was given to different causes. People basically paid it forward and did so joyfully in, in many ways. And I got a chance to speak to some of the recipients after uh, this was all done. And they told um, a, a surprisingly consistent story. So one woman, Lydia from in Indonesia, told me, I got this money and I shrieked at the top of my voice. But then I felt this overwhelming need mm. to honor what had happened to me and to, to give the same to other people. She said, it was really interesting language. She said, the thing about generosity is that it makes you feel seen. Mm. I felt yeah. seen and I wanted others to feel seen the way I had felt seen. Mm. And many, many others shared similar stories. There's a and a woman in England, Sarah Drinkwater, who got the money and decided she was going to give it all away, actually, to in, in sort of divide it into 20 chunks and give it away locally. And then the next day, she got a massive tax bill <laughs> right. um, that would have more than eaten this money up. She went ahead with it and did it. And, and she says that this was a huge moment in my life that I go to work now and I walk past many of the people or the organizations who I've given money to, and I just get joy from it every day. And it's like, whoa, this is beautiful. This is an amazing mm. fact about us. That, And it's, it's one of the key drivers of why infectious generosity can be a thing. Once, once you start a chain, others will often respond in kind yes, and carry right. it forward. And the chain keeps going, right? The chain and keeps going. So all this evidence that generosity makes people happy uh, leads to this age-old question that has vexed philosophy students for millennia, I think, which is, are we humans capable of doing anything that isn't in the final analysis selfish, right? I mean, it's it, on the one hand, it's it's... It's great news that generous behavior, self, selfless behavior results in greater happiness. On the other hand, it can lead some to feel a certain cynicism about why people do what they do. How do you think about this? Yeah, I think we have to really change our, our thinking here. Um, I, first of all, I do think that any act of generosity is done for a reason. Um, yeah, sure. Even if it's scratching your conscience, that feels better. You, you're eliminating some guilt, let's say. That's a reason to do it. There's so so it's it's pointless getting bogged down in the in the philosophy on this and insisting, as Immanuel Kant would insist, that it must only be done from pure motives. Nothing is done from completely pure motives. It, right. if, you know, I think it's that's the simplest thing to say. Even in the religious background that I grew up in, generosity was you know give. And your reward shall be in heaven. Mm, I mean, it's yeah. it's it's not pure motive viewed one way. Uh, what what is true is that giving in the short term is is hard, and that the rewards from it come later. And yeah. so, I think the way to think about it is again through this distinction of our reflective selves and our instinctive selves. Generosity is is an act of will of your reflective self over your instinctive self in many mm. ways. I mean, yeah. You, yeah. your instinctive self can drive you to a quick act of, of of generosity, but thoughtful generosity almost always involves your reflective self. And I think that is to be admired always, even though the reflective self knows that there may be long-term benefits back, and especially so in this connected era. And so I think it's almost like the one of the ideas that I'm most passionate about in the whole book is that we have to start embracing the notion of imperfect generosity. Yes. Um, yeah. In one way, it's always been imperfect. If perfection yeah. is our filter, we're just going to be perpetual cynics. We'll get nothing done. We'll see nothing good. We'll do nothing good. Don't do that. You know, stop nitpicking other people's behavior. Look for the good in what people are doing. And suddenly the world seems a much 
you know, happier, better place where we can yeah. we can inspire each other and cheer each other on instead of tearing each other down. Yeah, I, I, I think this reframing is, is is so important. I do think there's a loss here in the sense that if, if we think of generosity as a kind of happiness strategy, right, right, whether it's conscious or unconscious, there is something lost here, which is this idea of pure virtue. And this idea of a kind of pure virtue can give people a sense of moral superiority. If we shift the framing to say that virtuous people are in some sense just better at being happy and contributing to our to collective happiness, it, it's much easier to, to convince other people to be part of it, <laughs> right? It's a, it's a much more persuasive argument that like, rather than you need to start sacrificing more to say, hey, actually, this is a better path to a more joyful life, and we all win if, if we embrace this attitude. That's right. I think that's exactly right, and it's important. But I, I don't think you have to hold on to that language. I think, I think you accept that possibility. You accept that it's in everyone's interest to have, uh, to be strategic about their generosity and to invest in that part of themselves. But then the story very quickly becomes, again, one of just delight. It's like, do this because yeah. they're a wonderful person and they deserve your support. And it's great that you're doing that. And now we can get joy together. And you know, the, the, it, it quickly moves back to just a celebration of the kindness itself. What hopefully you get rid of in the process is this relentless nitpicking that is is so destructive. And I, I, I think it actually comes from a place where a lot of people were uncomfortable with any sense of moral obligation. Like it's it's annoying. Moral obligations are annoying. You know, the, yeah. it takes you to that that place of discomfort. But a bit of discomfort is actually quite quite good when all said and done. Like it, that that's what that's what pokes us to discover our, our better selves. So you know, it's. I, I do think that the rules and the language that we use needs to shift, and we we just we 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 can embrace each other's generosity, even if we know that there's other things that are going along for the ride. Absolutely, yeah. And I I wonder, you know, as you mentioned, you you grew up in a religious household. I I think your parents were missionaries, is that right? And and right, you were religious right. until your twenties. Yeah. And and as you point out in the book. Religions around the world meet weekly or more often than weekly so that we can remind each other of the importance of investing in a set of a set of shared values and supporting mm. each other. Do, do you think that we need a, a kind of secular church and 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 follow up question is Ted is a secular <laughs> church? Gosh, I I mean Ted isn't a secular church, although occasionally people have said it should be. <laughs> Yeah, I would have to meet I mean, more often, I think. You'd have to have switch yeah, it to weekly, yeah, right? Yeah. 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 I don't know what the answer is here. I do think that there is we're taking a huge risk by walking away from centuries of tradition where people have met regularly to realize that they're part of a community and part of something bigger than an individual. Even things as simple as book clubs, I think are a, are yeah. a beautiful idea. Yeah. Regular yeah. dinners among groups mm. of friends meet once a week and connect with each other and and talk about your community or the bigger issues of the world and how how you might do more together people like Alanda Bato and others have tried to do secular churches and they it hasn't quite yeah. worked yet i don't think yeah. there's a sort of creepiness to them or a it, it's just very i think Secular people find it very odd to gather and sing songs together about the glories of the universe. <laughs> yeah. um, but possibly yeah. we should. Possibly we yeah. we shouldn't. It's um um I I I think there's some experimentation here that should be tried. And I I, I definitely take inspiration from some of the giving circles that have, have formed, yeah. where people meet regularly to figure out just how to, how to be kind. And doing it collectively as a team sport is is uh, a really wonderful thing. Yeah, well, I'm I'm in on the secular church myself, and, and I like this argument that we need origin stories. The part of what religions do is provide origin stories, which which is part of how we define this sort of the in group, mm -hmm. I guess. And but a broad scientific origin story 
of our species, it helps to lend us the sense of our broad species wide in group perhaps. And uh, I, 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 I know that I know that um, probably critics of Ted have have referred to it as a secular church in a negative way. To me, that would be a compliment. Um, but but I have to I have to quote this. Uh, you had one uh, one example of the generosity of your of TEDx as an initiative is you had a so, someone who gave a TEDx talk named uh, a professor named Benjamin Bratton uh, in a TEDx talk and in a Guardian article called Ted quote Middlebrow Megachurch infotainment. <laughs> right. So, so that has been a line of criticism. What What's your response to to these these critics? Uh, I wish we could be a mega church. That would be that would be great. It'd be the best church ever because you only have to go once a year. You know, <laughs> right. the rest of the time you can just watch videos. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, look, we we get so many things wrong. Back then, when he was writing many years ago, yeah, the 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 argument was that we were lowbrow and that TED talks that only. 18 minutes long were a disgraceful disservice to the importance <laughs> right. of the knowledge they're doing. Yeah. Whereas now people dream of 18 minutes of anyone's attention. The world's, the world's changing so fast. And, and now how long is the TED Talk now? It's shrunk to 12 <laughs> minutes or something? Is that right? It's, a typical TED Talk now is about 12 minutes. I mean, it's, yeah. it's uh, some of them are sh shorter than that. And, um, and occasionally we'll go, we'll go quite a bit longer. You know, I, I would like a world where some ideas just have to be unpacked at much at much greater length, um, but mostly to have a chance of you know, <laughs> surviving against the blizzard of noise we're all in. You, you have to go shorter, and you have to then use every minute really, really well. Let's talk about billionaires and the generosity of billionaires. This is a controversial topic. There's a question of whether their generosity is genuine or whether we should be relying upon the generosity of billionaires to fix the world. You've had the good fortune of interacting with quite a few billionaires, I believe. What's your view? Hmm. It's a huge question. I get why there is so much resentment of billionaires. Inequalities a huge problem in our world and it's and it's getting worse and for lots of structural reasons so it's it's completely understandable why people say that that's just not fair that one person should have all that wealth and i think in a just world if if we were redesigning the world from scratch you would try and yeah. figure out a way where there would be a global taxation system that would allow a recirculation of a much yes. bigger part of that wealth than happens right now we don't have that world, and it's incredibly hard to get there. I s kind of support the people who are trying to campaign for it. But in the meantime, <laughs> yeah, what's happening is that when, when a billionaire tries to do some generous act, a pile of cynics will, will leap on it and say, what, how dare you? You're only doing this to massage your reputation or why didn't you do that better? Or why should it be you who gets to decide how to spend this money, et cetera, et cetera. And we're in danger of switching off one of the biggest resources we actually have to tackle yeah. stuff. There's $13 trillion or so, I think, held by billionaires, $13 trillion. Astonishing. And it turns out that the governments, as they are currently structured, are not solving many of the world's biggest problems. So, what I, what I believe passionately is that we need to take a different approach here and actually say to billionaires, we need you to spend more. We need you to do more philanthropy. And here's, here's what I've discovered. First of all, most of them really want to. Many of them have signed Bill Gates' giving pledge where they've actually mm -hmm. pledged to give mm -hmm. back um, the majority of their wealth, if not before they die, in their will. But the fact is that they're not giving that much yet. Yeah, yeah. And that... And the question is why? I, I think one of the key reasons why is that it's really hard to do well, like really hard yeah. to do philanthropy the, the wise way. And, and especially when you get your head kicked in if you, if you get it slightly wrong. But if instead of just saying, don't spend it or don't, you know, we, we hate you for having it, we said, well, what would be an amazingly cool way to spend that money? 
what could happen next? And so this is the project that I've that I've tried to do. It's a thing called the Audacious Project. There are other, by the way, there are many other people working on this. But the Audacious Project <laughs> starts with looking for amazing things that the world actually needs. So we go to people who are out there trying to change the world, social entrepreneurs, people running nonprofits, mm -hmm. and say to them, what is your biggest dream? What could you do if money was no object? Mm. Each year we get like a thousand plus applications for this. In there are some absolute amazing gems. And we filter down to about 10 projects and work really hard with the groups to try to turn these into credible, evidence-based, actionable, multi-year projects that amazing. are probably costed and you can see a pathway to it. Yeah, And then yeah. we present them as a group to billionaire donors and invite them to look at these projects. And something amazing has been happening, which is at the end of a two and a half day examination. I mean, they'll pick the ones that they most care about. Um, but collectively, they have ended up funding mm -hmm. all of these projects. So in wow. the last retreat we did, in the last hour of the retreat, after people had looked at all the evidence and so forth, you had this amazing act of infectious generosity where someone says, I like this project, I want to support it. And others see that and they go, well, I'm in too. And, and you see the infection spread, ping, ping, ping. And it becomes this effective, but actually really inspiring process. They find it inspiring. There are beautiful, big ideas out there. And if we focused on the dreams of what is possible and put billionaires and other donors in a position where they could actually step up and be recognized for supporting those things, I just I just think it changes the conversation in an absolutely beautiful yeah. way. Yeah. Now, on a personal level, Chris, are there are there types of generosity that you struggle with personally? How, how do you see your, your, your sort of personal journey to become a more generous person progressing? Hmm. I mean, I've, I've definitely felt guilty for a lot of my life that I haven't been more generous. My parents were outrageously generous with, I mean, with their whole lives. And, um, mm. and I've always been daunted by that. I don't think it's really until I discovered Ted that I felt fulfilled. I felt like I was doing my bit to to be a net giver rather than a net taker. I still don't give away, like I've never volunteered at a soup kitchen or, you know, I think I think the sort of the personal time-based things. I I I'm an impatient person and I'm time starved and I don't I don't give my time away easily or generously, I don't think. Um so I, I'm not good at that. And I'm not very good at the, although I'm working on it, at the kind of generosity of just of attention of walking down the street, you know, someone in need. I mean, I, I find that when, when when I give them attention and talk with them and so forth, it actually is satisfying. But um, it's, that's always been hard. But um, the test I, I, I put out there that seems to resonate with a lot of people is this notion of the question to ask yourself, because generosity is so complex, it comes in so many forms. Yeah. It's, are you a net giver or a net taker? Yeah, I love that. that. Yeah. I feel like that's the, the mm. single most important moral question you can ask of yourself. If we're ultimately a species of net givers, the future's going to be hopeful. It's going to be okay. You know, we can believe in each other. Um, we we may see something bad happen, but in another part of someone's life, they're doing something good. You know, like like there is no perfection in our lives. Everything we do is compromised. Yeah, I will yeah. buy something and then discover later that the supply chain, some child suffered. You know, it's possible to just curl up in a corner and not be able to cope with the future when if, yeah. if you're looking for perfection but if you if you if you take the view my duty my obligation is to be a net giver so there's many 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 ways to to yeah. do that starting with are you doing work that's meaningful and is is a net contribution to the public good um are you being generous with your time or your money the beautiful thing about generosity is that it is asymmetric. So the cost to the giver can be much less than the cost 
to the receiver, which means that it makes sense for you to find the type of thing that is relatively easy and joyful for you to give, but that would nonetheless be meaningful to other people. That's what you want to focus on. You don't have to give every form of generosity that makes you curl up inside is just too hard for you to do. You don't have yeah, to. Yeah. Um, and yeah. and if, if we all found the form of generosity that you know, the knowledge we have or the particular way we have of connecting with people or the resources yeah. we have, whatever it is, if we found that thing and focused on that to give away, if people enough people do that, all boats rise in that world. So yeah. anyway, so I, I, I neatly there deflected your very challenging personal <laughs> question into a more philosophical yeah. point. Yeah. Which is, no, is wait, my wait, way wait. of saying, ouch, and uh, I, I've, I've got a lot to learn still, but this is how I think of yeah. it. <laughs> well, well you, you, you and I both, I, I, I give myself a B, maybe a B plus in the, in the generosity department. I think I've done a pretty good job with sort of interpersonal generosity with the people that I know. Mm. But I, you know, it's so easy for all of us to look around and get in the survival mode and think, well, you know, uh, with whatever resources we have, what happens if things go wrong? How much do I need to save to protect my children and, and family in the future? Uh, it's very easy to rationalize not taking generous steps. But I do think there's this wonderful thing we discover, which is we discover how good it feels and how we're rewarded with sort of connection. And, and there's a virtuous cycle in, mm. in both senses of the word. <laughs> of, it's also, it's, 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 it's a muscle. It's a muscle. Yeah, like any, yeah. any muscle, it gets easier with, with practice. Well, Chris, your, your book's had a real impact on me. And I, I, I love your observation that people know broadly that love makes people happy and beauty makes them happy and me meaningful work makes people happy. And even money makes people happy to some degree. But we don't adequately appreciate that generosity is on the short list of the things that mm. deliver the biggest personal reward. And, and, and your book makes that case more persuasively than anything I've read. And I think that, I think that itself is, a, is an act of generosity. Well, that makes me very happy to hear you say that, Rufus. Thank you very much for that. Well, thank you, Chris Anderson, for, for being with us today. It's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Chris Anderson is the head of TED, and his new book, Infectious Generosity, The Ultimate Idea Worth Spreading, is out now. If you'd like to listen to the interviews with Dr. Carl Hart and Adam Grant, or hear the context in which we previously used my 2010 TED Talk on this show, you'll find links to those episodes in our show notes. If you enjoyed this show, the best way to support us is to become a Next Big Idea Club member. The Next Big Idea Club, as you probably know by now, is a book club curated by our friends Malcolm Gladwell, Adam Grant, Susan Cain, and Daniel Pink. They handpick the two best new books every quarter, and then we send them to your door. When you become a member, you'll also get ad-free versions of this podcast, access to author AMAs in our private LinkedIn group, and VIP invites to our in-person events. Sign up today at nextbigideaclub.com and use the promo code podcast to get 20% off. Today's episode was produced by Caleb Bissinger, sound designed by Mike Toda. We're able to spread generosity on this show thanks to the support of the LinkedIn Podcast Network. I'm your host, Rufus Griscom. See you next week. 